So our goal has been, given a matrix A and a vector B, to find the vector x that solves Ax equals B. The next thing we want to do is talk about the condition number of this problem. And of course, as always, the condition number would be the relative change in the answer, which is x, over the relative change in the data, which are A and B. But all of this data now is multidimensional, and so is the solution. So we're going to have to talk about how to measure the size of things that are multidimensional. Let's start with vectors. A norm on vectors is a function from the vectors to the positive real numbers that satisfies some key properties. The norm of any non-zero vector is greater than zero. Next, the norm of the zero vector is zero. Third, if we multiply a vector by a scalar, then we scale the norm by the magnitude of that scalar. And fourth, we have that the norm of x plus y is always less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y. This is called the triangle inequality because it amounts to saying the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. There are many possible norms, but we're going to use just three. First, we have what's called the two norm, or the Euclidean norm. The two norm of a vector x is the sum of the squares of the absolute values of all of its components with a square root at the end. This extends the Pythagorean theorem to n dimensions, effectively. It corresponds to length in the usual sense that we know in geometry. The two norm has a very important property. The two norm of a vector squared is the inner product of that vector with itself. If x is a real vector, or we have to use the Hermitian if x is a complex vector. But we won't be doing too much of that in the first half of the book. The two norm is usually the default choice. When you just write a norm, you usually mean the two norm. And that's because of this connection to the inner product. Next we have the one norm. The one norm of a vector is the sum of the magnitudes of its components. And our third choice is the infinity norm, with a subscript of infinity. That's the maximum of the magnitudes of all the components. It's also called the max norm. In these definitions, don't forget to use these magnitudes. I'm saying magnitude instead of absolute value because they might be used on complex numbers. So for example, let's look at unit circles, where the distance is measured in a different norms, all of them in two real dimensions. So if we look at all the vectors with a unit two norm, that means that one is equal to x1 squared plus x2 squared, which is just the usual circle. But if we look at all the vectors with one norm equal to one, well, that means that in real terms, absolute x1 plus absolute x2 equals one, and each of those absolute values could represent a plus or a minus. There are actually four possibilities for all the different sign choices. Now each one of these is a straight line at an angle of plus or minus 45 degrees. When you put them all together, you see that you get a diamond, or a sideways square. So that would represent all the vectors whose one norm is equal to one, or circle in the one norm. Finally, all the unit vectors in the infinity norm have maximum coordinate equal to one. So that means either x1 is one and x2 is between negative one and one, or x1 could be negative one, and x2 is in that range, and so on. Once again, there are four possibilities. Each of those possibilities is a horizontal or vertical line. 
So when you put all of these together, you end up with a square. This time, the edges of the square are parallel to the axes. There are two things that we might want to be able to do with a norm, even before we get to condition numbers. So one is to just point out that any non-zero vector x can be trivially written as the product of the norm of x times x divided by norm of x. That's kind of obvious, but what this is is a magnitude direction form. The norm gives you the magnitude of the vector, and then this part is a unit vector, which gives you the direction. The other thing we'll want to be able to do in the future is to say that if we have a sequence of vectors, it converges to a limit if the norm of the difference goes to zero. So that's a limit in the usual sense. Now we want to extend norms to matrices. This is more complicated, and it's a bit more subtle than you might be expecting. The key observation is that every matrix induces a linear transformation. This is a fact usually covered in your first linear algebra course. So we could define a function of x as a times x for all vectors x. That transformation has the properties of a linear transformation. And matrix norms are based on this interpretation of a matrix. So the d-norm of a matrix A is the maximum over all unit vectors in the d-norm of the norm of the transform vector A times x. Now, because of the scaling properties of norms, we could also write that it's the ratio of a x, norm of Ax over norm x for all non-zero vectors x. We call this an induced matrix norm. The d-norm of a matrix is induced by the vector d-norm. Now, when you work through the details of the definitions, it so happens that both the one norm and the infinity norm boil down to simple formulas. So these aren't definitions, but they are equivalent formulas. So the one norm of a matrix is equal to the maximum over all the columns of sums down the rows in absolute values. And the infinity norm is the maximum of the rows of the sums across columns. So we could say that the one norm is the maximum column sum, and the infinity norm is the maximum row sum after taking magnitudes. And you can kind of remember this because the one is tall and skinny, so you sum down the columns. The infinity symbol is short and wide, so you sum from left to right. And then we have a theorem, which proves some very important norm properties that we're going to use in our condition number derivations. So the norm of A times any vector X is less than or equal to the product of the norm A and the norm of X. This extends to any matrix product. The norm of a product is less than or equal to the product of the norms. And then finally, the norm of a matrix to a power is less than or equal to the norm of that matrix raised to the power K. Of course, this only holds for square matrices. They're the only ones that you can raise to powers. So if we call these three facts A, B, and C, how do we prove something like this? Well, the proof of A follows directly from the definition of the induced norm. So if you look at the ratio of those two numbers, norm of AX and norm X, well, that's less than or equal to the maximum of all such ratios over all vectors. But that, by definition, is the norm of A. And so if you just rearrange the inequality from the beginning to the end, you get the statement in the theorem. To prove B, again, we're just appealing to the definitions. The definition of the norm of AB, well, that's a matrix. So it's the norm of ABX over the norm of X. But by what we just proved, that's less than or equal to the norm of A times the norm of BX in the numerator. But the norm of A doesn't depend on X, so we can draw it through that maximum. And then what remains here is the norm of B. So from beginning to end, we can say that 
norm of the product is less than or equal to the product of the norms. Finally, part C just follows from applying part B, uh, where B is equal to A. Now, there's one thing I've left out to this point. How do you compute the two norm of a matrix? Well, it turns out that there is no simple formula the way there was for the one norm or for the infinity norm. The definition just doesn't boil down to something like that. So we'll just have to content ourselves to using the norm function in MATLAB.